So BPI France has built several partnerships with Sovereign Wealth Fund. The most strategic being the co-investment partnership with, we have with Mubadala, uh, Abu Dhabi Sovereign Wealth Fund. Their number have tremendously increased in the 60s, where we counted only six to almost 100 as of today. At the same time, they are very discreet. discreet. They are not very well known by the public. So the question we'd like to ask today is, uh, what can Sovereign Wealth Fund bring to their companies when they, when they invest in private equity? To answer this question today, we are very pleased to welcome Marcus Massey, Managing Director and partner, Senior Partner at the Boston Consulting Group in Dubai. Marcus, I know you wrote several papers about private equity, value creation, and sovereign wealth fund. So Marcus is going to uh, provide a um, general picture of sovereign wealth fund and their practice. Then uh, Daniel Kai, CEO and founder of uh, Vivalto Santé, uh, leading a French group of private hospital in France. Daniel Kai will provide its point of view as a CEO of a company which has two sovereign wealth funds as a shareholders. And to finish, Andres Rodenas de la Vega, director at Mubadala, uh, will explain in concrete terms what they bring to um, their portfolio companies. So Marcus. Thank you very much, Ariel. Uh, bonjour, Monsieur, Madame. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to give you an introduction into Southern Wealth Fund and explain a little bit what Southern Wealth Funds are, you know, where they invest in, how they invest in, and why you should be interested in them. So, Southern Wealth Fund is a fund which is set up by the government, which is managing the money of the government um, for the good of the citizen as well as of the nation overall. You know, almost every country globally has some kind of sub wealth fund, and especially the countries who are coming from an oil-rich, um, commodity-rich uh, environment. Um, they, when you look at them overall, Aria already told it, they are managing three to four trillion dollars on a global basis. If you put the GDP of all the companies together, the companies who are currently owned by some wealth fund would be the third largest country after China and the US. So it's a quite substantial investor. So if you think about private equity players and venture capital players, actually sovereign funds are probably even more important than private equity and venture capital together. So how do they invest? They typically invest in three areas. They either go by our private equity managers. Um, and ask them to invest in certain sectors and certain type of companies. And um, Andres, you know, coming from some of the Middle Eastern uh, some wealth fund, have a partnership um, in, in France, uh, investing actually locally into French companies with a clear mandate to actually invest here. The second one is they are partnering up with other investors, um, looking for opportunities, and they have their ears and eyes on the ground, leveraging the other partners. And sometimes they also go direct and uh, look for assets themselves. When you look on the right-hand side, you know they invest uh, on average 50 billion US dollars directly into companies. This is not counting money which they invest via funds, but these are direct investments into um, companies overall, which is probably the twice the size of the largest private equity company, uh, what they do on investments. Now the question is, where do they invest? Uh, and on the next page, on the, on the left-hand side, you see there are three sectors of interest. Number one is um, technology, number two, services, and number three, healthcare. And, and why do they do that? Because they understand from the country they're coming from the importance of healthcare, the importance of um, manufacturing of technology and services, and they're trying to diversify away from the industry which they have at home. On the right-hand side, um, you see actually that they're investing 80% of the money abroad. And uh, that's a substantial amount of money when you think about the total amount. Why do they do that? Because one of their mandate is to diversify away from the local economy. But also if they would invest uh, domestically, they would crowd out the private sector. So to a certain extent, they have a demand and a need to invest internationally in uh, particular in, in, in one of these three sectors. And then last but not least, on the next page, um, 
you know, very often you see them in the newspapers investing in large companies. You know, one of the big uh, investments was when PRF, Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, invested into Uber, three and a half billion, or when Temasek invests in uh, in Didi with two billion. But the reality is also they're investing actually across the life cycle of um, the, the of the companies. So they also invest in Series A, B, C, D companies. And as you can see, they are predominantly also working when, they're, when they think about venture capital to invest in companies who are in the growth stage. So somebody who has already a proven business model, who wants to grow internationally, who wants to expand their business model, you know, that's actually the sweet spot where most of the sovereign funds are coming in in order to help them uh, to grow. I can eat. <laughs> and so, uh, what are the benefits for having a sovereign wealth fund uh, as a shareholders? And do you have concrete examples? Yeah. So, um, when you think about having a sovereign investors, and, and the two gentlemen will talk about it a little bit more, I think there are a couple of benefits. Number one is a sovereign fund is not like a PE fund who has to make money immediately, who has to divest after six years, seven years, eight years. They are normally a very stable long-term investor. Some of the some wealth funds have um, holdings of 10, 15, 20 years and longer in their portfolio. The second one is um, they are uh, seen as a as a as an anchor investor, as a sign of trust for other investors. If you've got a sovereign investor in your uh, portfolio, other investors will naturally come to you because they say, if you have already crossed that barrier, then it's actually interesting for me to also uh, invest. And then, you know, they are also very actively on the board of directors to help you to grow. You know, they are trying to connect you with their portfolio companies. They are opening up the markets where they come from, be it from Singapore, from Asia, from the Middle East. Even when you look at some of the investors in, 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 in Europe, Ireland, for example, Spain, they're actively trying to get you into their country, open the market and help you to, um, uh, to grow your business. And then maybe two examples. Um, the good, you know, they are also there for good times and bad times. You know, on the left-hand side, on the bad times, when Corona actually hit, most of the sovereign investors said to their portfolio companies, "Stay calm. We will finance you. You're not laying off any people. You know, we want you to do the right thing. You know, we want to preserve the jobs. We want you to look at the business model and see how you can actually create a better business model once the pandemic is over." So very often they were actually given a clear mandate to say, you know, you're not optimizing for returns here, you're optimizing for the long run. And on the right hand side, one example uh, from Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi Development Holding Company has bought into one of the Jordanian um, agri-food companies um, with a clear intention to do two things. Number one is help them grow internationally. And secondly, ask them to come to the Middle East to help them to build an agri-tech cluster to set up an agri-tech park domestically with the investment volume of 10, 15 billion dollars overall. And as you can imagine, you know, for any company, if you get that kind of anchor investor who is more or less giving you proprietary business, that's a you know, quite um, interesting value proposition um, to have. Thank you, Marcus. Um, Daniel? Uh, can you tell us in what context did the entry of uh, BPI France and Mubadala in your capital uh, occur? Vivalto Santé was a small regional company at that time. It was at the, the end of uh, two, 2015, uh, and I think it was the first investment of Mubadala in a French company, which is based in healthcare company. And with uh, BPI and Mubadala, we grow from the 300 million euros to 1 billion, from a 13 hospital to 50 hospital. And in fact, at that time, as the founder of this company, more than 20 years ago, I was looking for what you say, Marcus. I was looking for powerful investors with some uh, solid 
healthcare reputations, which was the case of BPI, but also the case of Mubadala, who is a venture with a Cleveland Hospital in Abu Dhabi. And I was looking more important. I was looking for a, an investors who are able to to make a, a good governance spirit with all the other investors that I have, and, and especially with the doctors. I have a lot of doctors as shareholders. So BPI and Mubadala fit uh, the long-term investors, powerful and, and flexible mind to be adapted uh, not only on results, but uh, on the spirit of the deal. And how would you describe the input of Soaring Wells Fund, of Bobby by Friends and Mubadala uh, as shareholders, so in terms of governance and value creation? You want me to say everything? No, no but Andres can, Andres can, can say. No. What's, what's give to you? It's, it's give to you credibility from the other investors. That's for sure. And as an in-core investors, we, uh, we, um, we discuss almost everything, uh, which is the Biden build strategy, of course, which is an increase of capital, of course, but more important, on the times of the team spirit. Because when we grow up like, as quick as that, you have to build a team. And to build a team, you know, to evaluate the management and to be in discussion with BPI and Mubadala help us to find the right and the questions of the management and the growth of the company. And of course, the, the international relation of Mubadala, you, you don't probably know it, all of you, but Mubadala is is better known, is better known all over the world than the BPI in, in, in reality. Huh? When, when you go in Switzerland, in Spain, and in Portugal, it, Mubadala it's a stronger image than the French investors. So it gives credibility and it gives networks. That's a and powerful possibility to increase the capital and, and to discuss with the management. That's the four items that I can talk about. And how has it been perceived by your counterparts, especially, I'm thinking about the doctors uh, who are shareholders of Vivalto. <laughs> That's the personality of Andres, which was successful, because Mubadala, what is this? Abu Dhabi and so on, strange, strange country, what, what they are looking for. And in fact, when, when, we, when we speak business, when we speak healthcare, when we speak about how to, to procure good treatment for the good patients, I mean, all the doctors understand that Mubadala is close to, to us, close to understand uh, the special needs of, this, of our country. And for now, because we are moving now in the third steps of Vivalto Sante, so we are moving from one billion to two billion this year. So we are double the size with an extraordinary international expansion in, in Spain, Portugal, and Switzerland. And of course, when we, everybody so, shows uh, the possibility of this uh, Mubadala BPI tandems to, to help us. Thank you very much, Daniel. A question for you. Um, no, we are very pleased uh, with the long-term partnership that we have with, with Daniel Kai and, and with his team. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know if... Yeah. Can you tell us um, about the history of uh, the partnership between BPI France and uh, Mubadala and the French investment program? Sure. First of all, uh, bonjour à tous. And it's a great pleasure to be here with our partners at BPI, obviously with Marcus from BCG and, and of course with Daniel Kai. As, as he said, uh, the investment in Vivalto Santé was the best. And the first investment we, we made when we first came to, to France, and it's been a, a long-term partnership that I'm sure is going to be successful for many years to, to come. Uh, going back to the history of our France investment program, it was created in 2014 as part of the cooperation between Abu Dhabi and, and France. It started with 150 million euros of CDCIC, which now, as you know, is part of BPI France, and 150 million euros from Mubadala dedicated to making direct a private equity investments in, in France. In November 2017, when President Macron came to Abu Dhabi for the opening of the, of the Louvre Museum, we decided to extend this program with additional 500 million from BPI and 500 from, from Mubadala. 
to continue to do private equity investment, but I think what was interesting there is that for the first time we also decided to create an innovation VC platform to start investing in startups in, in France. And finally, I think as a testament to the very solid relationship between France and the UAE, in December last year when President Macron was, was in Dubai for, for the Expo event, both BPI and Mubadala, we decided to contribute additional 2 billion euro each, bringing the total size of our partnership to more than 7 billion euros, solely dedicated to, to investments in, in France. So that's a little bit the, the history. Can you tell us about the French investment program? Sure. Uh, into speaking about our strategy in, in France, we do three main things: private equity, venture capital, and, and, and listed investments. Maybe the listed investments. To start with that, this is channeled through Lac Darjan, as some of you know, or many of you know. Lac Darjan is the fund created by BPI France back in May 2022 to invest in the top listed companies in France. At that time, Ubadala made a significant commitment of 1 billion euros to support BPI France on this new venture, and everything we do on public is, is channeled through, through that vehicle. Going to private equity and, and venture capital, on the private equity side, we do two main things, direct private equity investments and LP commitments into some very selected uh, funds with whom we have a very close relationship, and actually Vivalto Partners, the, the fund also created by, by Daniel Kai, is a good example of a very valuable LP relationship for, for us. On the direct side, our ticket size is 50 to 100 million euros coming from Mubadala and uh, a similar amount coming from, from BPI. We are normally a, a minority investor, an active minority investor. We seek a board, board representation, and we are a traditional, traditionally sector agnostic, but the reality is that we have a preference for resilient sectors, downside protection, and healthcare has become a key element of, of our portfolio. On the venture capital side between BPI and Mubadala, we have an allocation of around 1 billion euros, and we do two things. I think here the split is more like 50-50. We make LP commitments to the top innovation and venture capital funds in, in France, and we can also invest in, in startups, tickets up to 25 million euros from Mubadala, and similar uh, amount again from, from BPI. We have completed two startup investments in France, one company called Oakin and another startup called, called Matera. So I think that's a little bit the, the strategy. And maybe the, the last point, what's the value add, and we touch upon this, of having someone like Mubadala on board. I think there are two main elements. Mubadala today is, is a large entity. It has grown very rapidly over the last five, seven years. Now we manage around $250 billion of assets across the globe. We are present in, in six continents, and that allows us to have a very good network in North America, in, in Europe, obviously Middle East is our home, and finally in Asia, where we have a, a significant China program. And what we try to do every time we invest in a company, we make sure that that international network is fully available to the portfolio companies, whether it's facilitating introductions or basically helping them to identify M&A targets, really making sure that this international network is fully available for the target companies. And I think the second element that is very important, especially when it comes to B2B, once we invest in a company, we make sure that the different portfolio companies of, of Mubadala are connected with this new company in which we have invested because they can become potential customers, they can become suppliers. So we really try to make sure that every new investment in, in our portfolio is fully connected with the Mubadala uh, ecosystem. So I think those are the two, two key elements. And finally, yeah, I mean, we are a financially driven investor. We are seeking financial returns, but uh, we don't have the traditional structure of a GP LP vehicle. So as it was the case, again, and that's a prime example of Vivalto Sante, we are very well equip equipped to follow a company beyond five years. We can be there for 10, 15, if we think the value creation story is, is there. Thank you very much, Andres. <laughs> Uh, do you have any question? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, as you have heard, there are several benefits for having a sovereign wealth fund as shareholders. And in the period of uncertainty we may face, uh, they will probably have a stabilizing role. 
thank you very much, Andres, Marcus, Daniel, for uh, uh, having shed light on Sovereign World Fund <laughs> and their practices. Merci beaucoup, un plaisir.